Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast. My name is Mike Indivina, and thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Today, my guest is Susan Rogers, who is an American professor, sound engineer, record producer, best known for her work as being Prince's staff engineer during his commercial peak. She worked on records like Purple Rain, Around the World in a Day, Parade, Sign of the Times, The Black Album. And in addition to all of that, she's also an author who wrote a book called This Is What It Sounds Like, What the Music You Love Says About You. And inside that book, Susan combines her record making days with her neuroscience background and you get this really interesting approach to understanding what our musical tastes are dictated by. And in this conversation, we have a really interesting chat about what makes music enjoyable for people and how we all have a different sound, a different listener profile, as she calls it, based on seven different elements of every record. And she breaks down that process for us. And it's really interesting because it makes you realize why you like the music you do, why you don't like the music you don't. And when you're making records, you can use this information to help dictate some of your decisions to make songs that are appealing to people and that really stand the test of time uh, with you as an artist and that hopefully resonate with your audience as well. So I think this is a really interesting conversation. And obviously we talk about all of her experiences working with Prince and what it was like to be in the studio with him back in the day. So we get a lot of stuff covered in this interview. So I think you're going to really enjoy this one. Let's jump right into it. Susan Rogers, thank you so much for being on the Master Your Mix podcast. How's it going? Going well. Thanks, Mike, for inviting me. It's You know, as well as anyone, that uh, the women are underrepresented, you know, in the, in the mixing arts. And uh, so uh, when, when we can contribute to the conversation, it, it really helps. It helps uh, us push forward here in this. Well, I, I definitely agree, and, and I try to make my best effort to get as many women on this podcast as possible, because I know a lot of great engineers that are women, and, and they deserve to have way more recognition. So, um, you know, we need, to, we need to change that stigma of the industry, for sure. Yeah. Well, thanks yeah. for having me on. Well, thank you. For people who might not be familiar with who you are or your background, can you give us that story of, you know, who you are, what you do, and ultimately how you got into all of the stuff that you're working on these days? Right. I'll try and stuff it into a nutshell, but it's going to be like a coconut. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so uh, I'm old, so that means I've lived a long life and done a lot of things. I started my career in 1978 in Hollywood, and I began my career as an audio technician, repairing consoles and tape machines and and things like that. Um, I didn't think that I there was any chance for me to be an engineer or producer. I'm a non-musician and female, and in 1978, you just didn't see women in those roles. But my uh, skills as an audio technician got me a gig with Prince in 1983. He was just coming off the 1999 tour, so it was he was just entering his peak creative period. He moved me from the tech role into the engineering role, so I was engineering for Prince, Purple Rain, um, through Sign of the Times and the Black Album, and that includes the Parade Album and Around the World in a Day, and stuff he did with other artists like The Time and Vanity Six and Sheila E and all that then I left Prince in 88, came back to Los Angeles and worked as a mixer on some records, producer on others, engineer on others. Did all that up to 2000. In the year 2000, I went to college, eight straight years, got my PhD at McGill University in Montreal. My PhD is in music perception and cognition. So after, after that accomplishment, Came to Berkeley College of Music in Boston and been teaching music production and engineering, but also teaching psychoacoustics as well for Berkeley. And uh, I just, uh, my most recent accomplishment was releasing a book last year called This Is What It Sounds Like, What the Music You Love Says About You. It's um, drawing upon music listening from two perspectives, that of a record maker and that of a uh, neuroscientist, an auditory neuroscientist. I love that. Yeah, there's so much good stuff that we can dig into here. Um, one of the first things I wanted to ask about was uh, that transition from being a technician to an engineer. Actually, actually, maybe even talking about getting into being a technician to begin with. Um, I think I read somewhere that 
someone had tipped you off that being a technician was maybe a more stable job in the industry. It was, is that correct? Is that what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the sentence I overheard. Uh, some instructor at this little one-room college was telling a student, well, if you want job security, become a maintenance tech. And I thought, okay, I got to find out what maintenance tech is because I want job security. It was the (laughs) smartest thing. Uh, It just was the right move for me. Studying basic electronics, basic audio electronics and acoustics, principles of electromagnetism, all that, that general understanding served my engineering career well because knowledge is power. And you're going to need confidence when you go into the recording studio. You're going to need <laughs> confidence. It's a tough gig. As you know, as we will talk about, as your listeners know, this is not easy, not to master anyway. So if you've got that additional knowledge of what's actually happening in those wires, what what's actually taking place, it gives you just a little bit more command of your of your sound sculpting performance. Not a lot more. It won't do the job for you, but it'll it'll help you feel a little more confident. Yeah, I love that. And I think it is such a lost art in many ways where, you know, people are just so used to their their tech working or they you know, it's become a lot more affordable so people can replace stuff very easily and, you know, if you know the electronics in and out in and out, then you can uh fix things and make yourself a lot more handy and yes. especially in a, a studio environment, you, you know, it's uh it's going to make you stand out, I guess, over a lot of other it people does. who just know the production side of it, and that's it, right? Yeah, it does. And if you, you know how record making, it takes place at night. And if it's one, two, three o'clock in the morning <laughs> and something breaks down, how comforting is it for your clients when your engineer, you're the, the person behind the, uh, in, the, in the control room, just says, uh, no problem, I got this. You guys take a break and uh, have it done for you in just a few minutes. You feel more confident. They feel more confident about their decision to hire you because they've got someone who who truly understands this uh, the signal flow. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me a lot of when I was in audio college. I remember my first my first semester there. Our production teacher he he didn't he didn't really want to teach us too much. He wanted us to make mistakes and learn how to do it on our own. And so he was very much like, "Okay, you guys have studio time tonight at like three in the morning." just go in there, just, just experiment. And like, he wanted us to break stuff so that we had to troubleshoot it at night. Oh, wow. And like, and it was kind of an interesting experiment because like it forced you to like stop and analyze, okay, what's happening here? Yeah. You know, like you really had to figure it out on the, on the fly. And I think I thought it was a really good lesson to, to learn and certainly something that saves us. I learned a lot by, you know, studying electronics and following schematics and things. But just as your teacher said, I mean, one of the best ways to learn was to take a microphone, get an adapter, you plug it into a mic cable, get an adapter, and go with a, a female XLR to TT and plug it into the patch bay and just sit behind the console and just go check, check, check and use your voice to route that signal all over the room. Just actually um, sending it and returning it, it taught you a lot about what was going on under the hood. Yeah. So from a, a technician standpoint, um It sounds like you were focusing a lot more on the electronics, um, but that transition into becoming an engineer, uh, you said that that happened when you met Prince, which I feel like that's a big transition to make, especially with an artist of that caliber. So how how was that experience of getting thrown into the fire there? Boy, I think that only could have happened with Prince. Uh, Prince liked working with outliers, and I certainly was one. He, He liked working with women, and I was a Prince fan, and I'd seen him in concert when I joined him. So we were a good match for each other. Um, But the main thing that facilitated my transition there was that Prince had his own sound, his own sonic signature, and he knew exactly how he wanted things to sound. All he really needed an engineer for was to facilitate his choices. Gotcha. He was perfectly capable, and he did, sit behind the console and adjust EQs and and, and things like that and adjust sends, but he would ask the engineer to to choose, let's say, a a reverb setting and to patch things for him, to put on a compressor or a limiter. That was at our discretion. He didn't care which. He didn't specifically ask us for a (laughs) compressor. He trusted that we, whoever engineered for him, knew what it was and when to use it. So um, I got to do some engineering. I didn't do as much of the artistic sound sculpting as I would do later for other artists who relied on me to apply a sound to their work, where Prince very much had his own sound. So I started by learning his ear, his sonic signature, and then I had to develop my own after I left him. 
That's interesting. Yeah, it's kind of uh, there's always that uh, that dilemma of like engineering versus produ- producing, and especially these days. I mean, everything's kind of just even more blurred, and you know, you, you're, you're kind of doing a lot of the same thing. You're doing everything, um, but back in the day, it was obviously a lot more divided up. And to have an artist like that who was very clear on his sound. You know, it, it makes sense that he would just want someone that was more of the engineer and, you know, facilitate that and, yeah. and get the recordings done. Yeah. And his sound, it certainly wasn't the best by far. Uh, I remember at one point in the mid 80s, I asked him about SSL consoles. And I said, you know, a lot of people are using those SSLs. They got the automated, the automation for the mixing and all that. And uh, maybe, you know, maybe we should think about that. And I remember he just turned to me and he said, we don't sound like everybody else, Susan. We got our own thing. And I just privately was thinking, yeah, we don't sound like everybody else. In many cases, we sound worse. Uh, he was smart enough, however, to recognize that when people go into a record store, as they did back in the 80s, buy a record, they're not walking in to buy sounds. They're walking in to buy music. And the music will override any sonic issues you might have on a record if the music is good. Uh, some of those Prince records that I did, I just wish, like you always do, I wish I knew more. I wish I had the skills then that I have now, but I didn't. And that's uh, as part of going, uh, growing up through this business. Y- you will get better with time. For sure. And it's interesting that you were talking about how you... At that time, you didn't really have too much experience or you didn't have your own sort of sound, so to speak. So you were learning his approach to it. Um, was that all just like him running through it with you and being like, hey, well, this is what I like, normally like as my chain, that kind of thing? Or um, like as far as learning his sound, how did you learn that? Yeah, he would either show me what he wanted by just sitting there and dialing in dialing in things like like EQ or sends, or he would explain what he wanted. And this is where my audio tech background was really useful. Because if he said, I I want a warmer reverb, uh, uh, let's say we're listening to a plate, and he says, I want a warmer reverb, I know right away what he means. Uh, Plates are kind of boingy, and he wants something that's like a chamber or some sort of room, and he wants a, a good high-frequency roll-off, and I can get that for him right away. He could describe what he wanted, and with my with my knowledge of audio signal flow, it wasn't that hard to get. I also yeah. knew what he liked because he always had his, um, his secret weapon was his Roland Boss pedals, those guitar pedals. He used them his whole career, and he used them on his drum machine. He used them on keyboards. He used them on guitar, on bass. He loved those things. And you could mix and match in the little gray plastic container that they had there. I think you have like six or seven different pedals. And so he would step on a pedal and dial in chorusing, phasing, distortion. There was the heavy metal pedal. There was uh, the flanger, which he loved, there was stereo delay, and he could dial in the feedback. So he was very hands-on with his pedals, and that pretty quickly taught me his ear, what sounds he really loved and, and went for. I could help him in the studio a lot by, uh, when we had new devices that were in the rack, I, I kind of would give him, give Prince his, his usual compliment of sounds I knew he loved, but I'd always add one or two new things just <laughs> to see if he would go for it, and if he liked it, He'd usually say something about about how that's cool, and I'd remember that, and then I could add it again later. That's cool. So you were kind of responsible for him evolving his sound, so to speak, in, in, in minor doses, I guess. In sure, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, had, he had tons of money, as rock stars did back in those days, so we could buy the latest gear that came on the market, as long as it didn't interrupt his signal flow. He was happy with it. I remember one of his guitar techs one day brought in a brand new pre-programmable guitar rack, and Prince wanted, well, he, he was willing to listen to it, but the very first question he asked this technician is, how do I change the sounds? And the guy very proudly says, oh, well, you program the sounds in advance. Prince just took off his guitar, set it down, and walked away. No <laughs> programming in advance for him. He wanted to be hands-on. He liked his boss pedals because he could be on stage, and he can just click them on and off and uh, as he's inspired. I always imagined that he would have been the type of person who was very embracing of new technology, but uh, I, I guess not. No, and here's why. It's because he was so incredibly creative. When you're hyper-creative like he was, and that's a neuroscience term for people who uh, 
have a couple of faulty circuits in their brain and have difficulty switching over from art to craft, when you're hyper creative like Prince was, your ideas just keep coming and coming and coming. And the last thing you need is for your gear to change. It's just going to slow you down. So if he knew his gear and he had that right there at his fingertips, that that meant that he could work. Anything that slowed him down, he wasn't interested in. And surprisingly, after he passed away, a year later, 2017, I visited Paisley Park Studios and talked with the engineers who were working with him at the end of his life. Went into the control rooms there at Paisley Park and saw he's using the same stuff. <laughs> it's his Roland Boss pedals. It's his same reverbs, his same delays. He, he, we went with that stuff for his whole life. He liked it. So why change? I love that. And I think that that's a, a good lesson to learn is that like when you need that creative energy, it doesn't make sense to be trying to reinvent the wheel and like, right. you know, trying all sorts of new things. And I think that that applies to people who are mixing. It's like having a template is going to help you sometimes. Just exactly. Because it's gonna get and you, having gonna constraints. eliminate all those decisions. Yeah. Having those constraints and yeah. those restrictions. Now, I've worked with really creative people, including Bare Naked Ladies and David Byrne and Gaggy Ta and just so many. So I'm not saying that this is the only way to be creative in, in their case. Part of their inspiration came from new technology and new sounds and, and new approaches. Your inspiration can come from, from anywhere, and uh, it helps. If you hit a wall creatively in the studio, it helps to hear a new sound, have a new musical instrument. Of course, it's going to be great. I'm just saying in the case of a hyper-creative, which is extremely rare, in that case, you don't need an additional source of inspiration. You've got these faulty brain circuits that mean that the slightest little thing. I had a pack of uh, wintergreen Tic Tacs in my bag that Prince went rummaging through. Not my purse. It was a shopping bag. Had a book in it. And uh, these wintergreen Tic Tacs, he was in the middle of writing lyrics. And the next lyric he wrote was uh, in the song Splash, cherry blue wintergreen fireworks in every scene. He, he, the slightest little thing. Would, in, would inspire him because those creative ideas just kept flowing. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think to myself, like, I feel like I hit writer's block all the time. So to have, have the ability to just like find inspiration like that is, is incredible. Yeah, it's very, very rare. And my I was in the music business in the studio pretty much every day for 22 years. And in all that time, I've only known a few people with perfect pitch, truly perfect pitch. And uh, I've only known two people who I would classify as hyper creative. He was one of them. Tommy Jordan is the other. That's that's incredible. Yeah, I, I imagine that. Um, yeah, that that would be kind of a blessing and a curse sometimes to be that creative because you you always feel like you're on the clock or you're working and and you know for him as a writer like you got to get these ideas down and that kind of stuff and you know maybe maybe in today's technology it would be easier for him to get those ideas down quickly on a phone or something like that but uh back then it was definitely more of a process to do so true and he didn't like to demo i don't know that uh, he, he had a cell phone of course later in his life but i don't know that he would have used it that much if he had an idea he wanted to go right into record mode he, 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 he wanted to e- express that idea on tape in the analog days. And he still used tape all the way up to the year when he passed, but he also switched over to Pro Tools. Uh, I, I remember one time we came home from tour. We came home from Japan, and he was dying to get into the studio. We went right into his home studio, and uh, we did the, the first Madhouse record, which was a jazz record. We did this whole album in four days, almost nonstop, very, very little sleep. And after one of those records, we're just wrapping it up. His keyboard tech, Todd Harriman, turned to Prince and said, how do you do it? How do (laughs) you go to sleep knowing you just played something like this? It's just Todd uh, Todd was blown away by what he'd just heard. And Prince said very sincerely to Todd, he said, that's the problem, Todd. I can't, I can't sleep. Uh, he'll he'd sometimes go upstairs after a session, brush his teeth, get ready for bed. He'd turn right around and come right back downstairs. And he'd sometimes say apologetically and sometimes defiantly, he'd say, uh, fresh tape, let's go around again. <laughs> Just because when he was brushing his teeth, a new song came to him and he had to, he had to capture it. He couldn't go to bed on it. He couldn't just write it down or record it into a voice memo. He had to make that record right then, right there. Interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, that also kind of brings up a, an interesting topic of, um, you know, the idea of creating demos first and then refining your sound before you commit to your final take. But, you know, you're saying Prince just would go basically all into final take. And uh, I think that's I think that's really interesting because so many artists feel like they need to develop their songs or stew on it. But maybe right. that's the maybe that's the byproduct of a hyper creative. Mm, well, what all of us do, uh, the science of neuro, uh, the neuroscience of creativity shows that what all of us do is when we need original thought, and I can use the term art to fill in for original thought, when we need to create something, whether it's a book or a movie or, or, or a song, we open up a couple of circuits in the brain to allow brand new ideas to flow. The easiest way to do this is by daydreaming and mind wandering. Let your brain off its leash. Let it go wherever it wants to go. It'll drift to its happy places, and it'll pull up old impressions or recent impressions. It'll pull up some little odd bits here and there, and you may get that inspiration, that moment of art that allows you to say, now that's an original thought. I'm doing this. So as soon as you have that original impulse for something creative, you move from art to craft, and you shut off these couple of circuits, and you move over to the craft portion of it, and you grab your tools, and you start creating the thing you thought of until you reach a stopping point where you say, okay, well, that's the chord changes, but what's the melody going to be? Oh, okay, now i got the chord changes and the melody. What's the lyrics going to be? And you're constantly going back and forth between art and craft. Uh, the more you craft something, the more you build on it, the better you the more you know your creation and the better able you are to kind of figure out where it needs to go next. So I like how my friend, uh, the sculptor Tim Bruckner says, craft is what sustains you when art fails you, which it will 90% of the time. In all of our creative work, 90% of the time we're executing our craft, 10% of the time we're inspired, if that, Mm. which is why uh, teaching students, it's really, really important for them to not be in too big of a hurry to put their music out there in the world. Hang on. If you're a creative person, your ideas are going to, they're going to come. You, you need to master your craft so that you can push sound around and get it to express what you're hearing in your mind's ear. Uh, learn your craft first. That's what all the experts do. Yeah, it's interesting. And especially with today's technology, I feel like artists have this pressure on them to be constantly releasing new music on a regular basis and, you know, being like very like high output, um, which makes it harder because, you know, maybe that's part of the reason why a lot of people would say like music is not as good as it used to be back in the day. Right. Because like now <laughs> people have to have to push it through faster or something oh. like that, you know, I mean, maybe that's just like a, an old, old, old person way of thinking about it or something like that, you know. <laughs> no, but I was just talking with students about that yesterday and they're just beginners just starting. Starting out, and uh, they, uh, one of them in particular, expressed something that a lot of young musicians are facing. They're musicians. They've studied their instrument for years. They got into Berklee College of Music for years. They've been working at their craft, and what they are being told and what they see is that they need to do pop music in order to get any attention out there at all. And these kids will often say, "I have zero interest in pop music." But my teachers, some of my teachers are telling me, unless I do these disposable two-minute pop songs, I won't have a career. So these poor young people are being torn and and believing that I, I just got to be, I got to be popular on social media and someone's got to grab my record and put 15 seconds worth of it on TikTok. And that's that's what I have to do. I don't know the answer. I'm not from their generation. I don't know exactly what to tell them, but I can tell them this. In every generation. There have been disposable pop records. <laughs> it doesn't mean that all pop is disposable because some great artists in the history of music have had pop hits. Uh, the, the, not all pop is vapid. Not all pop is disposable. Some pop is actually contributing to the arc of musical history. But um, those pieces that do accomplish that are drawing from music that's made outside of the pop realm. Uh, mm-hmm. there, there's some really serious record makers who have pop hits. Yeah, it's it's, it's a very fascinating topic. And yeah, I, I mean, I understand both sides of the, the coin where it's like, you know, people feel like they need to... Uh, 
compete with what what all the other people are doing to some to some degree and you know there's kind of like this social pressure on that but but it can definitely um be restricting for a lot of artists and and uh oh yeah you know, it, <laughs> we wouldn't have had the replacements or REM or uh, public image or the Sex Pistols or the Clash. We we wouldn't have had any of these great artists if they had chased the pop charts. Totally, you got to be out in front of the pop charts if you if you want to have longevity. But I, I understand the dilemma these kids are facing. They want to make a living at this, and commercial yeah. success demands you make something that is uh, appealing to the general music listener. Well, that kind of brings me to another topic of discussion that I, I wanted to chat with you about, which is that, you know, music these days with the tech, it's allowed us to really um, perfect the, the the music that we record. You know, there's a lot of editing involved and like, you know, a lot of music is super edited and it's, it's basically like flawless, you know, Um but I'm curious to know, like, I'm cu- curious to get your take on that, because I think part of the reason why we have that is because of this, like, need to have high output. And so we we really rely on these tools to just, like, get it sounding perfect and not have to, like, spend time getting better at our instruments or something like that. Right. Um, you know, I think I think that might have something to do with it. Um, but I'm curious to get your take on on the role of editing these days and, and um, you know, how much you lean into that versus you know, letting it be more organic. With these tools, we now have a capacity to make music that uh, actually is fake, meaning it doesn't reflect what actually happened in the recording studio. But, so what? (laughs) We also (laughs) have the capacity to make movies and television shows that are fake. There'll be a conversation on the screen between a human being and a zombie. It doesn't exist. Or there'd be a talking, I don't know, rabbit or something like that, which doesn't exist. So human beings have this craving for both fake life, like in animation and things like that, and a blend of real and artificial life. It expands our worlds. It 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 feeds our fantasies. This is this is kind of fun. So music is serving this role now in many people's lives as being a mere accessory to their moods and their feelings. So many people listen to music privately, not through loudspeakers, but through headphones and earbuds. It becomes a private experience, and so many people today are listening to music while they're performing other tasks. So music is not the main focus. I'm old enough to remember when I was a kid, you'd go to someone's house to listen to music. Like listening to music was the activity you were doing and you bring your records and you join up with their records and you put those records out on the floor, you put a record on the turntable, you listen to music, you look at the covers. This is what we're doing is listening to music. and People don't do that these days. So just because we have a new technology doesn't mean that the old technology has gone away. It is unfortunate for listeners like me who like picturing the band in the studio. I like a realistic record. It's unfortunate for me uh, when a record has been pitched and time corrected because I can't get the fantasy I want. Mm. When I hear a drummer push and pull, when I hear that elasticity in the rhythm section, when I hear a singer reach for a note and kind of hit a blue note maybe, you know, just a little bit under the pitch or or whatever, I, I, I'm getting a thrill from that, whereas a different kind of listener is, is is actually being turned off by that. They're thinking like, why didn't you fix those those out of time hits? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And uh, the way you worded it, it it made me think a lot of one of my previous interviews that I did on the podcast was with a, a guy named Chris Baseford, who is Nickelback's mixing engineer. And uh, the way he described Nickel, Nickelback mixes to me was that he makes cartoon mixes. Oh wow! Where they're where they're larger than life, and like he knows that they don't sound like humans. That's great, but. But to him, like that's part of the experience of those mixes is like making it sound humongous and 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 giving it this like different life. Well, um, there is a way. I agree with him a hundred percent. But there is a way of making a, a mix bigger than the reality that actually happened, and that's what that's your job as a mixer. Mm-hmm. I, I would always teach students because I learned for myself. You have to overshoot the mark when you're mixing. You have to. Add more, t- at least 10% more of just about everything if it's going to be exciting out there in the world. Uh, so I agree with him in that sense. 
I, I don't agree that everything needs to be made artificially correct. For some styles of music, that's the trend, you know? So with pop mm-hmm. music, you'd kind of have to do that. But with other styles, you, you'd actually be hurting yourself, I think, if you overly groomed it. Totally. Yeah, I definitely think that there's that, um, you know, people's ears kind of get tuned to the genres of music they, that they listen to. And as time evolves, they, they they hear more songs on the radio or whatever that have that consistency in their sound. So yeah. that maybe becomes the, the standard of that sound. And production wise, you, I feel like most most producers need to understand how to get that modern sound, but also still go back into like the older style and, and have that, uh, you know, that realism versus maybe the, the cartoony mix, that kind of thing and, and find that balance, right? Yeah, that's so, so true. Different listeners uh, have different sweet spots on these dimensions. That, that's what the, the book that I wrote is about, is how we all have a constellation of at least seven sweet spots corresponding to seven different aspects of recorded music. And uh, your sweet spots, mine, they all developed based on all the listening experiences we've had in our lives and our thinking, judging, categorizing brain that listened to a given record and said, this is amazing versus <laughs> this is unlistenable. And isn't that interesting how it happens? Brains decide what's yeah. good and what's bad. It's not driven by nature. It's driven by an individual brain. And when that happens, it means a psychological boundary has been drawn between two categories. This is a good drummer. This drummer is so not in the pocket. Where's that dividing line? For each one of us, it's, um, it's ever so slightly different. Of course, we can kind of all agree John Bonham was a great drummer, but it may not be someone's favorite drummer necessarily. This is what engineers and mixers become so good at. We are in touch with our listener profile so that we can instantly keep a running stream of decision-making going. We know inside what good is, our own notion of what a good sound is and a good performance is, a good blend is. And we're constantly, with our craft, shaping sound to match our personal template of what good is, hoping that it agrees with enough other people's templates of good that yeah. uh, we have some success. I love that. And it's something that I always teach my students. I, I always tell them that like, when you begin a project, um, you kind of need to have a clear understanding of what you want that album to sound like in the end so that you can make the right decisions on at the beginning to get that sound. Because if you don't, then you're kind of just like throwing stuff together and trying to fix it in the mix later. And, right, and maybe exactly. you've already like, you, you've, you've worked at a disadvantage because you maybe didn't record things properly. Yeah, and if if not a clear idea, at least a foggy idea. You got to have some concept of what you're going for. And it's a little bit like climbing a mountain. You know, when you're at the foot of the mountain, there's not much you can see because there's a mountain in front of you. But the higher you climb, the further your perspective goes and the more of the surrounding terrain you can see. So the higher up you go, the more you overdub on a record, the more you work on a record, the greater your understanding of what this record is. There's such a wonderful moment that happens. I love this. It's like the birth of a baby. But it happens... It's probably nothing like the birth of a baby. I don't have kids, so what do I know? (laughs) Anyway, it happens... About three quarters of a way into a mix. When you've climbed up that mountain far enough, you're about 75% done, and now you know what it is. Now you know whether it's single worthy, whether it belongs in the vault in the case of Prince, whether you took the right approach initially, whether you have to redo it and start from scratch. Now you know what it is. And that last 25% of taking it over the finish line is delightful because it almost feels like you're going downhill a little bit, not, not in terms of quality, but you're, you're coasting now. The hardest work was done. You made these, these big decisions and now you're just polishing it up. What's really tough is when you realize we can't get there from here. This, this mm-hmm. is not the right approach on this record and uh, now I, I, need, I need to rethink it. Those are hard decisions, but you have to do it. As Prince used to say, if you don't, It'll haunt you. Totally. Well, yeah, if you, if you aren't reaching your vision for this song, then why keep pushing forward trying to, to beat a dead horse, right? Like, go back to the drawing board and get it done right. But it's an interesting topic because I find that when I ask people, like, you know, what do you want your record to sound like? A lot of people have a, a really big challenge with answering that question because yes. there's there's, like, this dilemma of trying to get songs that sound like 
nostalgic songs that these people are deeply familiar with. And then there's also that modern standard. Mm -hmm. And and people have a hard time trying to define, like, do I, I want my songs to compare against these old songs or I want it to sound new? And and finding that balance can be really challenging. And And then the other thing that I find, too, and this is specifically with people who are engineering their own music, I feel like a lot of those artists have a hard time kind of identifying other artists that sound similar to them because like they want to seem like they're original. So even though they they have their own set of influences from all the music that they listen to for years and years, they, they still like, oh, nothing else sounds like me. They but always there's do. Prob- yeah. There's probably something, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 good for people for believing that they are truly original. We all are to some extent. It's, all, it's not an incorrect statement. However, we are merely building on and adding a variation to things that other people have done. There's other, there's other ways I found. I, I, get, I know exactly what you're talking about, and I've experienced that. I get good mileage asking artists questions along the lines of, um, what do you need this record to do for you? Mm. Uh, do you need it to be commercially successful? Do you need it to be successful with the critics and scholars? And uh, do you need other musicians to admire you and imitate you? I write about that a little bit in the book, uh, in the chapter uh, chapter on form and function. We're talking about record making, and I'm talking about the triple crown, the three different audiences for our recorded music. You can't please everyone. Pick an audience. Pick an audience. The record you make will be slightly different if you're targeting these different audiences. So asking asking artists, uh, who do you want to appeal to? Asking them, who do you think will be the core of your fan base? Men or women, college age, high school age, middle-aged people? Uh, who do you think? think is going to listen to your record, your music, and get the most personal feeling or attraction to it, helping them um, put their heads in the listener's experience. What will it be like for the listener when they hear this record? And who's most likely to say, oh, this is speaking to me, this is so beautiful, and who's likely to say, this isn't for me? You got to find that audience because you can't please everyone. Uh, You'll make your decisions on timbres and performance gestures and all sorts of things based on uh, who you think your audience will be. For example, when I worked with Bare Naked Ladies on Stunt, the year was 98, the very early conversations we had were about that. What do you want to do with this record? Answer was simple. We want to sell records south of the border. We want to sell records in the United States. Okay, got it. Uh, what about your audience? Are you happy with them, or you want to you want to change anything? You know, we we our audience is tilt female, and uh, we'd like to pick up more guys. Got it. So that meant to sell uh, bare naked ladies in the states. Our rhythm section had to get a little bit more R and B. Um, influenced a little bit more like like American roots music influence some subtle changes to the rhythm section and then to pick up uh, more guys we had to get a, a little bit well a lot tougher with some of the guitar tones more assertive on, on our guitar tones and we had to be okay with letting the wit of Ed and Stephen deliver a few zingers that some women might feel are a little bit mean spirited but guys would say you know good one dude. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, it's, it's subtle, it's small and it's subtle, but you are thinking about, here's who I want to have respond to this record, and here's the audience I'm actually willing to lose a little bit of in the name of picking up that new audience. It's true. I, think, I feel like a lot of artists feel like they need to play it safe to, to appeal to certain demographics or to like to have that mass appeal and uh it, it's it's funny hearing you talk about working with the bare naked ladies i was fortunate enough to get to work with ed as well oh, you love and him? Uh, yeah. and he's just he's such a great guy and it's funny like when you when you have the ability to like just hang out with him he he makes all the, the wise jokes and all that stuff and he's he's a really funny guy and so i could hear how like on the earlier albums, he was kind of safe with it. And then like, yeah, come come around your era, he kind of like made those zingers a little bit. And like, you got a lot more of who he is as a person. And, and it was like, he, he left this veil almost. Let's talk about that safety, though. A good analogy with music, for better and for worse, is food. Uh, music of all the art forms is the one that's easiest to personalize. I don't know, many people who can afford to buy original paintings 
certainly not the good stuff that you'd see in galleries and whatever. So uh, how many people actually have a library of movies? But we all have a music library. It's fast and it's easy to consume and it's self-curated, really easy. So it's a little bit like food. Um, If you play it safe in music, think about it. Imagine a food that appeals to everyone. Your first response might be milk. Well, no, no, I don't drink milk. A lot of people are lactose intolerant or they just don't like milk. So no, it definitely wouldn't be milk. Uh, bread. There's a lot of people who don't like gluten or they don't eat bread. Okay, what's, what's, what's something that appeals <laughs> to everyone? Uh, water might be the thing that appeals to everyone. There are actually people who are allergic to water. So the more you try to appeal to everyone, the more bland your work gets, you will not appeal to everyone. There are people who love pizza, people who never touch it. People who love burgers, people who never touch it. Pick an audience. Be yourself with all of your might. Let your production and mixing team, let them fan you out, for example. Um, my favorite music is R&B, soul music. If I'd had my druthers, I'd have been a, a, a mixer for R&B and soul music, but no, those calls didn't come in. The calls that I got were from alternative indie music, which worked out really well because my R&B sensibility was pulling alternative indie a little bit closer toward a certain rhythm on bass and drums that was a little bit more, a little bit more R&B oriented, whereas the other members of the team, songwriters and players and uh, producers in some cases, they can take the whole top line. They can take the, the, the melody, they can take the lyrics, stay in that alternative indie realm, let me handle some R&B down there on the floor. And that would fan out our music to give, uh, give it a little bit more soul than the alternative indie might have. So it's fine to fan out, just as if you were a chef, it's fine to add a little bit of Asian spice or something from another cuisine to fan out your work. But do have an understanding of who your audience is and and what they hope to experience when they engage with your work. I love that. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, now that we're talking about this, it's making me wonder, like, when it comes to creating the vision for the projects that you work on, obviously you're talking about how you've got this R&B background and, and you have your own specific so sounds that you like and all that. But when you're working with artists, there's that, there's always that kind of butting of heads sometimes where it's like the artist vision, your vision. And sometimes you have to kind of cross over. Sometimes maybe you just have to like avoid those projects at all costs because you don't see eye to eye. But I'm curious to know, like when it comes to creating that vision for the projects you work on, how do you generally approach that? You, I mean, you did talk about some of the questions you would ask mm, the artist, but... I have a, a little bit of a... What you might call a weakness or you might call it a strength, but I've really got a lot of musician worship going on. (laughs) A lot, especially as a non-musician myself. Uh, So I am inclined to, whenever musicians are saying, oh, it needs to be like this, I'm inclined to believe them. Uh, The other thing is I, I was always, especially coming up from Prince, I was always just so well aware that my job was to facilitate their vision. No one's going into a record store looking to buy my work. They're going in to buy the artist's work. And and all I'm doing, whether as a producer or mixer, engineer, all I'm doing is facilitating the making of an art object that they said they wanted to make and that perhaps collectively we agreed would be the smart move for them. So when an artist is making a decision that you know is going to be risky, that could hurt their chances. The only thing you can do and the thing you should do is uh, tell them why. Answer the Mm -hmm. question that any three-year-old would ask, which is why. Tell them, here's why I think that is a risky move. Here's what you stand to lose by doing it this way, to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. And and there's always that that fine line, and there's like this like psychological uh, element to producing records that goes into it of you know helping coach musicians throughout the process and yeah. and you know working together in, in a room. And um, I don't know if this was your experience, but I've heard from some people that had the chance to work with Prince that they said he was a very quiet person who sometimes could be hard to read in terms of like what he liked or or when he, when he liked someone or when he didn't like someone or some element of his of, of what they were doing that kind of thing. Was that your experience with him? 
He definitely was quiet. Peggy McCreary, who started with him uh, in 1980, Peggy was the staff engineer at Sunset Sound where he liked to work. And Peggy was on his uh, early sessions for the Controversy album. And at one point he was so, we just talk really quietly and very, very low. And at one point, Peggy just put her face right in his face and said, this isn't working. You need to speak (laughs) up. I can't give you what you want if I can't hear you tell me what you want. Speak up. And uh, this is before he was a superstar, so he could do things like that. (laughs) And it worked. He did start speaking up. He started started speaking up more. But bless his heart, uh, he really had an aversion to small talk. He he could be talkative, but for the most part, his happy, happy, happy place was to come into the studio with all his stuff all set up in advance. He would either call and tell you what instruments he wanted, or he'd leave a note on the console. You'd set up everything, route everything, have the tape there ready to go, and he could just move bam, 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 bam from instrument to instrument without having to talk. It made him so happy, and uh, and it was his favorite way to work. If you hit a wall and he needed to talk, if he was comfortable with you, he he would speak up. But if he was working with someone new who maybe didn't know his shorthand or his codes, it struggled a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, there's like I said, there is always that um, there there are a lot of artists that are very introspective. And sometimes being the engineer or the producer to work with those artists can be a bit of a challenge. And like there's that psychological element of like, am I doing the right thing or do am I, you know, how do I coach them to do the right thing or without offending them and that kind of stuff. So I, I was curious to get your opinion on how you navigate those kind of things when it comes to working with those quiet, introspective artists. Mm, that's It's really hard. It's really hard. Reading the artist is an art. It's the art of record production. And uh, and sometimes it's with some people it's easier than with others. With beginners, it's um, it becomes over time. If you're experienced and they're beginners, it, it, it's very very satisfying and very rewarding because you can build their confidence. You can help them to learn how to be recorded. Um, this is this is an interesting um, an interesting observation. So producers take meetings with bands with artists because they're being auditioned for the role of producer on their record. And when I would take producer audition meetings, it was always very telling during that meeting when the drummer would sometimes lean in and ask, how do you like to record drums? <laughs> because they don't want to know how you like to record drums. If they're asking at a producer audition meeting, how do you like to record drums? What they're actually saying is, I was traumatized in the studio by an earlier producer and I need to know your, your style. That's what they want to know. Mm. So when you hear that question, uh, a good way to respond is saying, well, how do you like to record drums? You're the one who's playing. Uh, do, do you like to have everybody all close around you? Do you like to be isolated in a booth? Uh, do you like to do all the drum tracks on, on all the songs at once and get all the drumming out of the way or work on one song at a time? Uh, how many toms do you bring in? You start asking them about their their gig and their preferences, and you let them know right away, you are in charge you're the boss of me. You let me know what you need to do and what it takes to get the best performance out of you. And that's what we're doing. You're in control. That's with beginning artists. With the more experienced artists, you have to follow their lead because they've already made records and they know what works for them. You have to follow their lead. This was extremely difficult working with um, Paul Westerberg, the wonderful Paul Westerberg from The Replacements. I worked on his first solo album. I was the engineer and Matt Wallace was the producer. And God, that was tough. It was Paul Westerberg's first record sober and his first record without his band. And he was having to relearn everything. Matt Wallace was a champion. Matt knew exactly how to handle him. But for me, I I really struggled. It was that introspection thing that you're talking about. He was just quiet. He wouldn't say what he wanted. I had to try to read what he wanted. It can be hard. Yeah, it's very interesting. And uh, yeah, I, I love that. Like just really asking those questions early on in the process. I think that's a really important thing to do because, yeah, often you learn how to like win that client over and how to give them that experience that ultimately makes the best record. You know, when someone when someone comes to you traumatized from a previous experience, 
your job is to make sure that they have the complete opposite experience. Right, exactly. you know, that, that's yeah. why they're coming to you. So if you know that stuff, you can make them have the best experience and ultimately, you know, make them happy and satisfy their their record needs and and hopefully have them as return customers because they, they keep coming back to you, right? And we're pulling music out of people. That's what we're doing. Sometimes it just goes off like a fountain and you don't have to do a lot of work to get music out of them. But in every case, you're helping them communicate. Uh, uh, from the singers to the to the percussionists, all the way up and down the chain, these people are expressing something with their hands and their lips and their feet and their bodies. They're expressing music, and music is an expression of life. So they're expressing life. You 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 want those musical gestures to communicate. It can communicate positive or negative emotions. It can be vague or it can be precise. But you have to make sure every time that it's saying something, and that's your job as a producer or mixer engineer, you're, you're, you're listening for the communication inherent in the gestures. For sure. Yeah. I, I love that. I, I think communication is such a big part of it. Um but it also kind of ties into something else that I was curious to, to know. And you were ta- just talking about like the job of a producer and engineer. And um, from my understanding, Prince was the type of person who liked to work at all hours of the day. And as his engineer, you were basically on call for that. And kind of whenever he needed you, he, you were there. And um, that kind of brings up a topic of like work-life balance. And I'm curious to know about that because I feel like a lot of people have this dream of getting to work with their favorite artists. But to maybe have that like constant on call on demand lifestyle that can be very very taxing for a lot of people um so i'm curious to know how you managed to navigate through that in your own career and whether you think that people need to be willing to do that kind of stuff and work those crazy hours to be able to uh to to get into the industry and actually survive and, and yeah. stay as stay it's as an, an interesting concept the concept of a work life balance and Automatically, when we think balance, we think 50-50, 50% work, 50% life. But it's up to you where you put that fulcrum. If your idea of a good balance is 95% work, 5% personal life, you're balanced because it's working for you. The only thing we have to decide is whether or not what we got going on right now works for us. So yeah, Prince, brutal, brutal hours, 24-hour sessions were were the norm. I'm not exaggerating here. That was the norm. A 12-hour day was like getting a day off. Uh, (laughs) He really really worked so hard. 48-hour sessions were not uncommon. 48 straight hours in the studio without any sleep. And the longest I ever did was 96 hours. But here I was in my 20s as an engineer for not only my favorite artist in the world, but one of the most successful artists in the world. Where the hell else would I want to be? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Where the hell else would I want to be? So that balance at that time was basically 99% work and 1% whenever I could catch a little bit of sleep. And I couldn't have been happier. It, 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 it worked for me. In my life, uh, not having a husband, not having children, I have chosen to put that fulcrum to where uh, my work kind of is my life. Uh, I'm older now, so I'm, I'm I'm moving it a little bit. But yeah, uh, the, 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 the main thing is what makes you happy. And we all have to decide that for ourselves, how to get the life that we want, including the work that we do. Mm-hmm. I, I love the way you define that there. Because, yeah, I, I could definitely think that there's, there's um, I mean, maybe, maybe when you're younger, you have less responsibilities and mm-hmm. all that stuff. So you, that that fulcrum can easily shift because you have that flexibility to do so. And for a lot of older people, you know, maybe with families or whatever, then it becomes a little more challenging. And obviously the priorities change there. But, um, but yeah, I, I'm always interested in, by people who were like a staff engineer who basically are always on, t- on, on call and, and, you know, how that... Uh, I know work can sometimes be taxing and, you know, especially if you're working with artists that are very demanding or, or, you know, poor communicators or that kind of thing, you know, yeah. you know I can make it even yeah, harder. It can so be really hard. Yeah. Yeah. So I was always, I'm always interested in learning more about the people who, who were like the staff engineers and um, how you, how you get that balance. We're always performing this cost benefit analysis. We're always aware of what we're getting. What are the benefits of any activity we're engaged in? And we're also aware of what it's costing us. And sometimes those demanding jobs, they're costing you. But if you're getting as good as you're giving, or even better, if you're getting more than what it's costing you, you're good. 
those entry-level jobs, um, they often establish our careers. So yeah, it's costly in terms of number of hours you can sleep or your social life or your, your, your personal life. or your, I didn't see my family for a, a really long time while I was working with Prince. God forbid I should ever go on a date. I mean, that's what caused my uh, relationship with Prince to deteriorate. After over four years of working with him, I met a guy and I went on a date one night and he couldn't, Prince couldn't reach me. That was the beginning of the end, which was so sad. But yeah, it's costing you. But I, I was well aware at that time that yeah, but it's benefiting me so greatly. I'm getting a career out of this. So we're always doing this little mental analysis. And as the years go by, you might figure, it's costing me too much. Or, yeah, the benefits are cool, but I need some new benefits now. So I'm going to move over and do something else for a living. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, definitely when you're at that younger age, you, you again, you have that ability to make that decision like okay yeah maybe this has launched my career i've done what i needed to achieve out of this like i can move on and still have my career in a yeah. different capacity that kind of thing yeah that no, makes a lot of sense yeah um i'd love to chat about your book as well because obviously you've you've, you've talked about it briefly but i'd love to dive a little bit more deeper deeply into it um you talked about how your book covers how we each have this unique like listener profile and you'd mentioned that there are seven dimensions of every record that people gravitate towards and that's what ultimately makes them have their own unique taste um so i was wondering if you could briefly elaborate on uh what those elements are and how they impact our musical tastes so they're all things that i learned about in grad school at mcgill and uh they're all supplemented by my over two decades in the recording studio. So when we listen to a record, our brain is scanning for treats. If you're listening to a familiar record, you know right where those treats are. So if you're listening to Led Zeppelin, well, for me, my treat is going to be honing in on those drums, listening to John Bonham. I just love Jimmy Page's guitar playing, so I know I can listen in on that timbre and his his uh, pages, choices, and arrangements. I, I, I love Robert Plant's vocals. I know a lot of critics hated him. I loved him. So I know where the treats are, and that's what, that's what we're doing as we're listening, is we're going to the places that have given us a dopaminergic reward in the past. Uh, there are at least seven ways in which we can get a treat from listening. Four of them are relate to music. Four of them are melody, lyrics, rhythm, and timbre, meaning sound itself. But the other three are aesthetic. They apply to movies and television, books, and all art forms. That is authenticity. Authenticity is your sense of whether or not the performance gestures are sincere. The other one is a very familiar one, novelty versus familiarity. Some of us are listening for a lot of innovation on a record, and we get lit up like a Christmas tree when we hear it. Other folks have a stronger preference for familiar, traditional musical forms, and they get their treat from hearing a familiar form played to perfection. And then the last dimension is uh, something I alluded to earlier, realism versus abstraction. It has to do with the kinds of mental visualizations you like to have when you're listening to music. I like picturing the band in the studio, and I have since I was probably five or six years old. I like realistic records made with real, actual, physical, musical instruments. So I can have my treat my treat of seeing the band perform, but uh, many people prefer electronic music, music that features musical instruments that don't physically exist anywhere, audio chimeras and sound design things that are it doesn't physically exist. And those folks are more likely, according to some research I did with my co-author, Ogi Ogas, those folks are more likely to prefer electronic music so that they can have the visualization of seeing abstract shapes and colors science fiction worlds, fantasy realms, the sort of uh, graphics that would accompany a video a game. So we, we like the music we like based on where we find our treats. This is why when you ask people what kind of music they like, they often say, oh, I, I've got really eclectic taste. Of course you do. Of course you do. <laughs> so uh, recently I listened to Eddie Palmieri because I, I wanted that Latin groove. I'm listening to him chiefly for the rhythm. I don't speak Spanish, so I don't know what the lyrics are about. I'll listen to uh, a new favorite artist, Curtis Harding. I really like his lyrics a lot. I like his melodies too. Someone else I'll listen to for their innovation. Uh, 
Spinetta Jade, just heard about that. That's a new Argentinian artist that I heard about, and it's very innovative for me. So we, we get different treats with different styles of music. Interesting. So when it comes to pop music, like pop music is typically defined as like the popular choice that most people collectively agree that they like the sound of. Um, would you say that that is made up of, um, is there like any consistency between, like any trends with, with mm-hmm. pop music that fall into these seven categories? Oh, yeah. I describe it in the book in the chapter on novelty versus familiarity. So as I said, some of us like a high degree of novelty on our records. Uh, you know the band Tennyson from Edmonton, Canada? Yep, I've heard that Brothers name. Yeah. Oh, I love them so much. They're innovative. And the Jacob Colliers of the world are innovative. And there, there are 100 Gex are innovative. And there are some of us who are seeking that out because it's rewarding. I'm on that right side of that bell curve. I prefer, I'll take a record that's not so good sounding in favor of getting my treat of original thought. My brothers, on the other hand, uh, they like their traditional rock music. They like their rock music. They're not going to be interested in Tennyson or any innovative style. They want to hear familiar music. And if a new artist comes along in rock, they'll be accepting, but only if it hews to the familiar form that they know of as rock music. Familiar forms include disco and reggae and gospel and blues and bebop jazz. Many folks stay in the lane of more familiar forms. Where pop music resides is right at the top of that bell curve in that the formula for pop includes, for most people, the perfect blend of novel and familiar items. So pop records might be in 4-4 time. They might feature some familiar musical instruments, but they might be totally innovative in their sound design. They could be totally innovative in their rhythm. That's what rap and hip-hop have been doing for many years. They could be totally innovative in their lyrical content. Some of the lyrics that are going on in pop music today are beyond the pale for us in the older generation, but they're pushing the envelope. They're saying something brand new. So that that perfect blend is where pop resides for most people. It's not too novel, not too groundbreaking. For those of us who like novel music, it's a little too safe, a little too predictable for us. But for most people, it's just the right blend of not too familiar and not too uh, challenging either. It can be any style of music, as you as you alluded to earlier. Opera was pop in the uh, hundred years ago. Uh, jazz was pop at one point. Uh, funk was pop at one point. Disco was pop. Uh, new styles are always coming along, but whatever is the most popular is pop music. Yeah. So as far as what makes a song a hit versus what doesn't, you you alluded earlier to songs that are kind of disposable. Um, you know, what what would you say makes a hit song appeal to so many people? Is it is it like all those things just kind of like that familiar familiarity, like that that uh, ratio that you were kind of talking about there. Yeah, like- the um, scientists have tried and failed to predict what records are going to be hits. It, it's a complex formula, really complex. There's a lot of a lot of variables in there. Let's say let's say that an artist and producer, a team, is in the studio right now, and they are crafting what they consider to be a perfect pop record. What was the hit record right before, five minutes before, they released their record? So you can't control what other people are releasing. And if somebody releases something just ahead of your record that makes your record look imitative, say goodbye to your dreams of pop success. What about what's going to come right after you? Say you release your record and an hour later, somebody releases a record that just resets the bar for what good pop is, you're done. So there are just too many variables involved. There are cultural trends. If you're singing about how great it is to be, oh, I don't know, let's say living in California, and then all of a sudden there's (laughs) fires and floods and storms and plagues and droughts, and it's miserable to be living in California, you you just missed your chance. So we we do our best. Uh, Pop music is, for for many, in many, many cases, not in every case, but in many cases, it's disposable in the sense that the lyrics aren't saying anything new. They're they're following an old formula and they're not adding to the canon 
of of great music. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, sometimes I think to myself, like, maybe it's just like marketing and, you know, the fact that we hear the same songs over and over again on the radio that like eventually you kind of are like, OK, I'm into the song now, you know, like, so, but I guess that's the familiarity thing as well, right? It's like yes. sometimes that's kind of forced upon you as well. Exactly. Studies of liking show it follows an inverted U shape. Now, people, when they encounter a new stimulus, whether it's a food or fashion or uh, a brand new stimulus, a new record, let's say, their initial inclination is to not like it. Because the biologist P.B. Metawar said the human brain treats a new idea the way the human body treats a new protein. Initially, it's like, hate it. But if you get a second exposure, or even if the song goes on long enough, by the end of the song, it might not feel quite that aversive. And you get just a, a bare tolerance for it, like you might for food or a new style of fashion or whatever. So, yeah, I guess it's okay. But then, if you get exposed to it over and over again, and you hear it or encounter it in a variety of contexts, you see how it works, and it becomes functional. You see what its utility is, and you can say, okay, well, uh, that's not really my thing, but I, I see how some people like it. If you encounter it during a time when you're having a really great day, you've got those feel-good neurotransmitters in your body, and that song is coming, coursing through your brain, and you think, you know what, this song is actually pretty good. Then, if it oversaturates the marketplace, you drop back down and you're like, I am so sick of this song. Please don't let me ever hear it again in my life. You go back to disliking, unless you personally have found a use for that record. And and, and you bond to it. And then it goes into your library and it becomes a favorite. I love that. So now that you've put so much time and research into studying these seven different dimensions, if you had to sum up what makes a great song, in your opinion— what are those elements for you? Oh, I tell you right now. Uh, give me that drummer who's got that elastic pocket, that snare that can be just a little bit behind the beat, with that hi-hat that pushes and that snare that pulls. Ooh, I love that. I, I love that groove. I love that groove. That was the late, uh, great Al Jackson Jr. who played on those Stax records. None better to me. I like, and you're not going to find these uh, these seven sweet spots all on one record, I don't know that, that it's even possible, but uh, in, in another sense, I love innovation tremendously. First time I heard Tennyson, I instantly knew, I love these guys and I'm going to love them for life. I just <laughs> It was instant, it was immediate. I love these guys. I know that I like uh, realistic records, which are not as popular these days. The first time I heard Curtis Harding, which was just a couple of weeks ago, instantly, I fell instantly in love because I could hear everything that he heard. I could hear in his choices. I could hear Marvin Gaye. I could hear Bill Withers. I could hear the OJs. I could hear the Beatles. I could hear all of his influence. And he was putting them all together in a brand new way, instantly. Love, love, love. In many cases, I love great lyric writing, and for me, I love uh, Lana Del Rey, who's making records today, and Father John Misty. I, 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 I love the stories they tell and the images that they project. Uh, I love sincerity and authenticity. My favorite musician who ever lived was the, the bebop jazz pianist Bud Powell. For me, it sounds as if his hands bypass his head completely, goes from his heart to his fingertips. His expressivity is, is perfection to me. Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald as vocalists for their melodic phrasing and their technique. Uh, all you need is one treat. All you need is one. I, I can listen to James <laughs> Brown and uh, I don't care about the lyrics. I don't care about the storytelling. I'm listening for that rhythm. I'm listening for Jimmy Nolan on guitar and Clyde Stubblefield on drums. That's my treat. And uh, that's all I need. Uh, my brain will will hone in on, on that happy place and be perfectly satisfied with that record. I love that. Yeah, I love how well defined you've you've got your your listener profile. It's great. Well, Susan, this has been incredible. It's been amazing to learn your process and Thank to you. learn more about the um, like the psychology of how we listen to music. I think that's very fascinating. Um, so I'm really grateful for you being on here. If people want to learn more about you, uh, maybe follow you online or learn more about your book, what's the best place for them to do that? Really, um, I don't have a social media presence. I've got a Twitter, but I don't. I don't know how to use it. I've used it a few times. <laughs> I'm not good with that kind of stuff. Older generation, you know, we never had a use for it in my day, so we don't see an obvious need for it today. But I do have a website for the book, and there's a record poll 
on there up at the top. You can click on record pull and you all tell me, name a record. Tell me about a record that just makes you weak in the knees, that just makes you swoon. So I, I enjoy that record pull section of the website. It's just all one word. This is what it sounds like dot com. The title of the book is an homage to Prince's When Doves Cry. This is what it sounds like when doves cry. So this is what it sounds like dot com. You can go to the record poll and tell me about a record you love. I love it. Well, well, again, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mike. It's nice to talk with you. So that was my interview with Susan Rogers, and that was really fascinating. I really enjoyed learning more about her studies into what makes us gravitate towards certain music more than others, and learning more about those seven elements that go into every song. It's really fascinating, and I think that when you start to analyze your personal musical tastes with these seven elements in mind, it definitely makes things come into perspective a little bit more and definitely will help you understand whether you're an artist, like what kind of music you're trying to make, if you're a producer, what kind of sounds you're trying to achieve on a record. Uh, You know, a lot of this understanding can be really beneficial to you and the way you handle your music. So definitely go check out her book because I think you're going to find that very fascinating. I also thought it was really interesting to learn about her process of working with Prince and what it was like back in the in the day and, and being in the studio and how he handled his creativity and just that whole hyper creative element about his process is very interesting to me. And I think that Susan was definitely the right person to be in the studio with him because she fully understood what it's like to be working with someone like that. And uh, obviously they made a lot of great music together. So it was really interesting to learn more about the history of those early Prince recordings. So I hope that you enjoyed that episode just as much as I did. And I hope that you got a ton of great stuff out of it. If you did, and you're looking to learn more about this kind of stuff, definitely make sure to subscribe to this podcast. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live each and every Wednesday morning. And also make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com. That is a website where I help out musicians with creating pro sounding recordings from their home studios. And if you're struggling to understand what to do in the recording, editing, or mixing process, and you're looking for a repeatable process that you can use every single time you go to record music so that you don't have to guess at what you're doing. You don't have to rely on presets or settle for lackluster results. If you want to know how to get a pro sound and you want to know how to do it efficiently, make sure to check out MasterYourMix.com. I've got tons of great resources on that website designed to help you out and get very clear on that process. And one of the resources that I want to point you to is my book. It's called The Mixing Mindset and inside I break down the process of mixing step by step so that there is no guesswork. You know exactly what to do, what to listen for, how to dial in your settings and ultimately get the sound you hear in your head to come out of your speakers. So once again, check that out. It's called The Mixing Mindset and that's available at MasterYourMix.com. So that is it for this episode. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end and I can't wait to chat with you in the next one. Talk soon. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit masteryourmix.com.